Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to listen to me. Um, I'm planning to talk for about 30 to 40 minutes and then open it up to discussion and questions. I want to share with you a little bit about what came before this book. And I want to share some of, what, of the content of the book and how I started the Forgiveness Project. And we unfortunately have a situation which <laughs> where the book hasn't arrived. So I've really had to exercise my forgiving tendencies today. Um, and actually, at the end, Paul, perhaps you'll come in and tell people what... There's always Amazon, of course, but I think there might be another way that you'll be able to get the book. I hope so, anyway. Um, so my background's journalism, and so it was obvious from when I started The Forgiveness Project that perhaps there would be a book somewhere there. And actually, over the course of about nine years, I was contacted a lot by publishers. And we'd have these meetings, and some agents as well, we'd have these meetings, and they'd say, well, look, you know, I'd already written about three books before. Um, you know, well, what book do you want to write? And I never, I never had an idea. All I knew was that I didn't want to write another book about forgiveness, which, you know, had a chapter on health, a chapter on psychology, a chapter on religion, um, and weaved in perhaps my own little small forgivenesses along the way, because there were a lot of very good for b books like that. So I just sort of gave up, and I was finally uh, um, approached by a publisher called Jessica Kingsley, who has her own small independent publisher, and she said, well, of course, you know, the stories, that you're all about story and sharing narratives of hope and transformation, and that's what the book has to be. The stories were mainly online already, so I thought, well, you know, why do you want a book as well? But she convinced me that actually a book had a whole new reach, and so... That's exactly what we did. But the book is more than that because it also includes, you know, a 35-page introductory essay by me in which I said everything I really felt I had to say about forgiveness in 35 pages. It also included two um, great, I think, forwards. And the reason why there are two is that I was chasing Desmond Tutu for about 10 months. Um, I, I knew him already. He was the founding patron of the Forgiveness Project. But um, I just couldn't get through to him, and he has been very unwell. And I tried five different sources to get to him, all people who were quite close to him. And I was just coming up with a complete blank. Um, and all I was saying to him was an interview I did back in 2003 with you. Can I use that as my forward? And I was just getting no answer from anybody. So I went to Alexander McCall Smith, who some of you will know. He's the author of The Number One Detective Agency. And I knew that he was really into forgiveness because we'd had a conversation. He felt that forgiveness was the key sort of answer to everything in life. And so I asked him if he would write a foreword. And he's written a brilliant foreword, um, which really sort of talks about how he's used forgiveness in his books and in, in his work as a, a lawyer and a, and a professor at the university. And then, of course, I then got a, an email that was forwarded to me from signed Arch, which said, I'm so sorry you've been having all this trouble. Of course, you can use the words. So that was wonderful. So I also had um, a foreword by Archbishop Desmond Tutu, which was, I'm sure many of you have read his books about forgiveness. And he really is the leading exponent of forgiveness in this world today, I think. So coming back to the Forgiveness Project um, 11 years ago, I'm just going to share with you a little bit about how it all started. So it started for two reasons, really. In 2003, I was a journalist, and happily so. And it was one night when I was watching London News, and there was a story of a father whose young child had accidentally been given the wrong drug in a hospital and had died, and it was the inquest, and as the father came out of the inquest, a journalist asked him, how did you feel being in the room with the man who'd administered the lethal drug? And I expected to hear very understandable words about litigation and retaliation. And instead he spoke about how he'd seen the doctor across the room, how upset he was. He'd walked across the room, he'd held him in his arms and said, I don't want this to ruin your life like it's going to ruin mine. I want you to know I forgive you. And at that time, the lead up to the war in Iraq, it was a very unusual story. And I really, it moved me greatly 
And I had also been on the war, the march in Hyde Park, and I felt kind of quite motivated and politicised by this issue. I began to feel very strongly that the more you come down hardly on groups and individuals, the more people just regroup and come back in a more resistant and more angry way. So these two things sort of collided at once in my life, and I thought, well, what can I do? I'm a journalist. All I can really do is collect stories. And I was travelling quite a lot at the time for Oxfam and the Red Cross, and I started, and I said to a friend who came with me, who was a photographer, we were working together, um, why don't we just collect stories about forgiveness, you know, and then we'll publish it in the Sunday Times or the Telegraph or somewhere. And he thought it was a good idea, and that's what we did. So in the course of a year, as a very private, personal project for myself, um, really kind of grew out of anger, I think, in a funny kind of way, um, I collected stories about forgiveness. And my, at the very beginning, my ideas were really very simplistic. I thought forgiveness was this place you arrived at where everything was kind of okay again. Um, a panacea for all ills, a cure-all, fix it. Um, I soon realized that was not the case, that uh, forgiveness was difficult, costly, risky, slippery, <laughs> complex, but also transformative transform people, it allowed them to turn the page, to take another step, it healed. So I became more and more interested. I also had wanted to collect stories from victims who had forgiven the unforgivable. Again, I thought, well, why don't we also share <coughs> stories of perpetrators, people who'd harmed, uh, former aggressors who turned their aggression into a force for peace. And so the collection of stories, which again I thought was just going to be an article or something, um, was 26 stories from all around the world, from victims and perpetrators of crime and violence. Um, I wanted the stories, which then became, it then became an exhibition, because Anita Roddick, who was the founder of The Body Shop and a really strong social activist, saw the raw material and she funded it as an exhibition that then, then was in 2004, which kind of led me to do this work. But I, I wanted people's own stories to be heard in their own voices because my years as a journalist had told me that fixed, fixed perspectives and hardened attitudes only shift when we hear the stories of others. So I really believed in the power of story. And um, so... My vision and my ideas about forgiveness changed a lot during that, that year, and it kind of really hooked me. Um, I understood that it really had this power to allow you to move forward, that you wouldn't, the pain of the past wouldn't poison the path of the future. Um, and that seemed a really important message, actually. I really also discovered that forgiveness was highly controversial. It was contested territory. People loved it or hated it, were inspired or affronted by it. This is why the exhibition that I created, I called it the F word. Because for some, you know, forgiveness was a really dirty word. Um, and so the exhibition was put on at the OXO Gallery. At that time, it was just a one... I was going to go back to journalism as far as I was concerned. It was something quite exciting because I didn't usually do exhibitions. It was very journalistic in form, strong portraits, the interviews I wrote up in the first person. And the response to that exhibition was absolutely overwhelming. It was nothing I expected. It was extensive. It was astonishing. The press went kind of crazy at that time. These were narratives of hope at a very bleak time. Um, and I think I hadn't expected any of that. And I had no idea that exploring this subject of forgiveness would have this kind of impact. Or that, you know, being exposed to healing narratives would allow people to do their own personal inquiry, if you like, and shed light on, you know, all of our own inner grievances and resentments. Because what I, what I didn't tell you was the stories were very extreme. I knew, kind of as a journalist, to just shock and surprise people, you needed extreme stories. So I chose to collect stories about terrorism, about violence, about abuse, some quite high-profile stories, but many not. Um, 
I also discovered this quote recently, and I realized this is exactly kind of what happens when people are exposed to the story, stories. Um, it's a couple of psychologists said this, a story told at the right time in someone's life can shine a light sufficiently bright to illuminate the road ahead. And I think that's what happens. I, I get so much response from people. I know that's what happens. So due to the overwhelming response of this exhibition, a uh, few of us who were working together on it you know, decided to start a charity called The Forgiveness Project, which would use stories of victims and perpetrators to explore concepts of forgiveness and reconciliation in order to help people break out of their own cycles. Presenting stories became really kind of like our, our sole purpose. Um, now, I knew as a journalist the power of story. Um, I knew that when I wrote up individual interviews in people's own voices, people responded more positively than I gave when I gave my own opinion. <laughs> and I think that's because people could actually walk in the shoes of those people easier. And that's when people wrote letters and said thank you because I've been through this and it's really helped me. So I knew that. Um, story, I think we're kind of hardwired for story. It activates the right brain, it opens up um, imagination and, and of course stories understanding the story of the other person especially when that other person may be your enemy is about building empathy about c connection about collaboration about overcoming differences overcoming defenses um, of course stories as we all know aren't in themselves good stories can create greater divisions they can amplify hate we see that on the internet happening a lot. Nevertheless, the stories that I choose to collect and share are what I call restorative stories, restorative narratives, healing stories, reconciling stories, however you like to describe them. And I think you get the gist of what sort of stories those are about transformation and change. Um, so... 11 years on, I mean, the Forgiveness Project is an organization that doesn't just share stories. Our website gets 500 visitors a day. We have the exhibition, The F Word, which has been seen in 13 countries to 70,000 people. Uh, we put on events, we have a lecture, an annual lecture. We have, on our 10th anniversary year, we put on conversations about forgiveness, one a month. So we're trying to get people talking and debating. I see our organization as a place of inquiry and discussion and exploration rather than propagation or trying to persuade anybody to think or do anything. Um, I think also what, what I've seen happen is that when people share their stories, it's very stories of pain, it's very healing to be acknowledged and witnessed and actually that can help in the recovery. In the prison work that we do, because we run a restorative justice program in prisons which shares stories of victims and ex-offenders. I, I noticed that offenders hearing the story of victims or of ex-offenders who come in and share their narratives of change, they are given a vision of what they might become, which is much more effective than telling someone that continually that what they've done is wrong. But I think for any of us being exposed to these stories um, really show that recovery and resilience does not require superhuman strength or um, sort of moral or spiritual superiority. It is really about just being able to adapt to circumstances. Because when trauma and hurt and pain happen, people get frozen and stuck. They um, very often lose not only them, their self, self, sense of self, but they lose many, many things after a traumatic event. And um, there's a woman called Anne Marston, who's worked as a child psychologist. She works with trauma. And she talks about what she calls ordinary magic, which others have talked about as post-traumatic growth. And she says, this is what she's talking about. It's not something that you have to have this moral, spiritual strength for. It could be any of us. And it is this ability to adapt to circumstances. And, what it and when I read this, it fitted in beautifully, because it's exactly 
what these stories, the key components of these stories. It's three key factors. One is connecting and contributing to community. Two, sharing your story with others. And three, developing a sense of meaning out of the hurt and trauma. Um, and when I read that, I had already seen that one thing, the only thing actually, that all these stories have in common is that the journey of forgiveness is about creating meaning. And by meaning, I don't mean making sense out of what has happened to you, because sometimes trauma and hurt and pain is completely senseless. But what I mean is um, not uh, being able to pursue intensely the things that matter to you, acting in congruence with what is important to you. And that puts meaning back into your life. And it enables people to function again and to become part of a community again and gives them coping skills. And that is so much part of the forgiveness journey. Um, the reason why I think people respond positively to our work is that these stories are very authentic. Um, they're real. They don't try and push and persuade. They're not, I mean, the one thing we don't do is um, share stories of hate, but there seems no point. But a lot of the stories start with hate, you know, so that's the journey of change. Um, and I think they're <clears throat> presented in a way that encourages analysis and inspiration rather than dogma or the need to sort of fix. And they're not all, I mean, for instance, there's a guy called Rami Elahan, who's part of the Parent Circle, an organization in Italy which is um, family survivors from Palestinian side and Israeli side. Um, an organization that actually Desmond Tutu, when I met him in 2003, said to me, you must go and see this organization. It's remarkable, the work they're doing. And Rami Elahan is one of um, the members of the Parent Circle. And he says, for instance, I do not forgive and I do not forget, but the suicide bomber who killed my 15-year-old daughter was a victim just like her, grown bitter out of anger, poverty, and shame. So for him, he, he doesn't like to entertain the word forgiveness. It's not a useful word for him. And yet when you meet Rami and he talks about his mission in life is understanding the pain of the other, you know he is one of the most forgiving people you've ever met. And that kind of really interests me about forgiveness. It's not um, something you can easily box. Everyone's got their own definition. No one can agree on it. Everyone's got their own limits and parameters. Um, and I think that's what the Forgiveness Project really tries to explore. <clears throat> if you Google forgiveness images, you will find crosses and hearts. Um, that's never really done it for me. It, it, it doesn't show the sort of gritty, difficult side of it. It doesn't show that it comes out of damage, that you have to lose something to forgive. You have to, or rather, you have to relinquish something. You, your righteousness, your right, the right to be right. Um, I, and I also wanted to create a secular space, um, only because very often people assumed that um, forgiveness belonged to Christianity. And I wanted a way to show that that isn't necessarily the case. Um, and that, so we collect stories from all faiths and none. Um, and I've actually, and at first I used to describe the Forgiveness Project as grittily secular in quite a sort of angry kind of way, or not really angry, but kind of determined. And then um, a woman called Marian Partington, who's one of the stories that we share, some of you might know her story, her sister was murdered by Rosemary. Um, and Fred West, she, she took real issue with me. She said, you know, she's a Quaker Buddhist. And she says, it's just not true, you know. Uh, the Forgiveness Project is not grittily secular, she said. And I reflected and I realized she was right, actually, because actually when you read the stories, that each person is on a spiritual journey. There's no question of that. Um, and by spiritual, I think I'm thinking really because it, each story is about self-reflection and about being consciously compassionate and about looking for the unseen behind the scene. So um, whatever your terminology, your you know, definition of, of spirituality is, I think forgiveness is a spiritual journey. <clears throat>
I think for too long, forgiveness has been unhelpfully linked to the ideas around self-abnegation and um, as a heroic endurance. Um, I, and, I, and it's taken on this kind of sacred other quality, which I think detracts from the up, down, backwards, frontwards, you know, inside out sort of, um, which is how I see forgiveness made up. Basically, it's kind of complex. And I see it increasingly, the more I delve into it, actually in some ways, the less, the less I kind of know. Um, I'm also quite wary, because it's a, it's a strange space that we occupy, because we're really trying to be nuanced about this and not trying to push people down the road of forgiveness, because I think the more you push, the more people resi resist. And literally just say, consider this, read the stories. Um, there is some sort of, there is a bit of dialogue out there and discussion which kind of propagates forgiveness as, you know, you'll be damned if you don't, almost. And I think that's very unhelpful. Rowan Williams said um, in one of his Easter addresses, I think the 20th century saw such a level of atrocity that it has focused our minds very, very hard on the dangers of forgiving too easily. Because if forgiveness is easy, it is as if, the suffering doesn't really matter. And I think, you know, that he had a very good point there. I think also there's a danger, looking at, the, you know, are there dangers to forgiveness? You know, it's a question. But I think there's a danger if administrations or governments tell their citizens that they should forgive because it could be masking accountability. And certainly there was some of that in Rwanda and a little bit in Burundi. Maybe some people would argue a bit in South Africa as well. But these are questions. Um, and the, uh, there are other questions, you know, is it stampeding on the memory of a loved one who's been murdered, say, when a family member comes out and talks publicly about forgiveness? It can divide families. Um, I'm also wary of the sort of um, discourse which... Uh, I have to just first of all say that there's a lot of evidence which says resentment, bitterness, hatred is very bad for your health. And this is uniform and uncontested, and there's no question about that. However, recently I looked up on the inter internet and I found a Dr. Stanley Ford, chief of surgery at the cancer treatment centers in America, who said refusing to forgive makes people sick and keeps them that way. And I really had to question whether that was the kind of thing, you know, the chief of surgery should be saying, only because it makes people feel bad and it's not helpful. Not necessarily true either, because there actually is no causal link between cancer and um, unforgiveness. And I'm sure if you read carefully, he's not saying that, because he'd be far too clever to say that. But nevertheless, the fact that he is the chief of surgery and he's talking about unforgiveness and cancer, I think is kind of, becomes a bit of a tyranny if you tell people that they're going to be so depleted and, and destroyed if they can't forgive. I don't think, it, for me personally, it's not the way to do it. Um, uh, John Braithwaite, who um, does a lot of restorative justice, he's kind of like one of the forefathers of restorative justice, says, forgiveness is a gift and we destroy its power as a gift by making it a duty. I just want to share, I wanted to read you before I finish one of the stories, but I also wanted before I do that to share with you just some of the things that really impacted on me from the many stories and people that I've met along the way. Um, so Khaled Alberi was one of the first stories I did, and he was... He had joined an Islamic fundamentalist group in Egypt many years ago and had lined himself up ready to be a suicide bomber. Um, and one of the things he see, then things happen, I won't go into the whole story, is in the book. Um, one of the things he said to me that he comes to the conclusion that the most dangerous thing in life is when people become convinced that truth has just one face. Um, and I thought that was, you know, a beautiful and inspiring way of putting it. He's written a book called Life is More Beautiful Than, Par Life is More Beautiful Than Paradise. 
Um, and it's a highly poignant story, which is, is particularly salient at this time where them and us politics is increasingly clouding conf um, complex conflicts, I think. Joe Berry, um, whose father was killed in the Brighton bomb and has done a lot of work with Patrick McGee, the Brighton bomber, she also taught me a lot about empathy. She said to me that she had come to the conclusion that if she had lived Patrick McGee's life, perhaps she would have made his choices. So really what she was saying was that she, if she actually stood in his shoes, perhaps she could have done what he'd done. And that's quite a hard thing to hear, for some people to hear. But to me, that really sort of made sense. And then there's this guy, Letlapa Mafaleli. Um, Letlapa was the chief of operations for APLA, which was the military wing of the PAC in South Africa. And he was responsible for organizing a lot of terrorist attacks on civilians in retaliation for the attacks on the civilians from his side. Eventually, some years later, he met the mother of one of his victims, Jin Furi, and he heard her story. And when he heard her story, everything changed. His justification changed, his life changed. From that moment on, he started working for peace. And he really taught me why an eye for an eye simply cannot work. He said, I believed that terror had to be answered with terror. And I authorized high-profile massacres on white civilians in the same way that our oppressors had done to us. At the time, it seemed the only valid response. But where would it have ended? If my enemies had been cannibals, would I have eaten white flesh? If my enemies had raped black women, would I have raped white women? One of the reasons I think forgiveness is, is very tricky and difficult, particularly when we're talking about evil, if you like, the kind of things that are unimaginable, grand scales atrocity, which really stretches your imagination. Um, most people, those are things that most people would say are completely unforgivable and should never be forgiven. But there are people whose stories that we share and who people I've interviewed, who've sort of made me understand how you might be able to do that. And Marion Partington, who I mentioned a bit before, is one of those people. Her, daughter, her sister was killed by the serial killers, Rosemary Fred West. Um, and she said after hearing Rosemary West's evidence at trial, she said, her story seems to be about the impoverishment of a soul that knew no other way to live than through terrible cruelty. And her journey has all been about recognizing and not recognizing the humanity in Rosemary West and not demonizing her. And in that sense, I see forgiveness as being not about condoning an event or, or um, condoning an act, but about forgiving the frailty and fallibility in humanity in all of us and recognizing that we're all connected at some level. I, in the next, I'm just going to read you one story from the book which I'd like to share with you, but I would just say that in the next, I've run the Forgiveness Project for 11 years now and the stories are very extreme, but in the future I'm much keener really to collect smaller stories, stories to do with family rifts, to do with divorce, to do with hurt. And because I think in a way they will impact even more. Um, and I just read a lovely thing that David White, the British poet and philosopher said, I just read it yesterday actually, he said, all friendships of any length are based on a continued mutual forgiveness. Um, so I'm just going to read you the story, and then we've got time for questions. Yeah. Um, so Wilma Dirksen is a woman I was very lucky to get um, a Winston Churchill Fellowship, which allowed me to travel and look at restorative justice programs in Canada and America. And I went to Winnipeg 
And when I was in Winnipeg, I was told, you know, you've got to meet Wilma Dirks, and she is Mrs. Forgiveness. It slightly put me off, um, <laughs> because um, I thought she might be preaching, and I'm sort of a little bit averse to preaching. I just, I was prejudiced. Anyway, I met her, and she was absolutely wonderful. I met her husband as well. And I, I love her story, because it's so, it has kind of everything in it, really. So it's, her story starts in November 1984, when her and her husband, who's called Cliff, her daughter, I think she has three children, her oldest daughter, Candice, then aged, um, well, a young teenager, does it, doesn't come home one evening from school. Every parent's worst nightmare. And this is what Wilma said. For six and a half weeks, we didn't know what had happened to Candice. She just disappeared into thin air. But everyone knows that when a 13-year-old girl goes missing, then something is terribly wrong. She was a child in a woman's body, that moment of vulnerability, when one minute they're a child and the next a woman. Eventually, Candace's body was found in a shack not far from our home. Her hands and feet had been tied. Someone had forced her there. But we lived with the mystery of not knowing who had done this for the next 22 years. The day her body was found, all our friends came to visit, bringing warm food with them. There was so much love in the house that it helped us get through. Then at around 10.30 that evening, when most people had left, there was a knock on the door and this stranger stood there. He told us, I'm the parent of a murdered child too. He was saying we now believe to an exclusive club that no one wants to belong to. We invited him to the kitchen table and for the next two hours he told us in vivid detail everything he'd lost. His health, his relationships, his concentration, his ability to work. He'd even lost all memory of his daughter because now he could only think of the murder, the trauma and the hate that followed. Cliff and I went to bed that night, hor horrified by that graphic picture he'd painted. Having just been through the pain of losing our daughter, it now seemed we might lose everything else as well. And so we made a decision that night that we would respond differently, and we chose the path of forgiveness. This decision was validated and verified the next day at the press conference when a reporter asked us what we thought of the offender, and we replied that our intention was to forgive. From then on, we became known as the couple who had forgiven. In hindsight, I don't think we had any idea what forgiveness looked like in the face of murder. But our state of mind at the time was such that we knew we had to say no to anger and obsession. We determined to resist anything that would keep us in a state of emotional bondage, both for our sake and the sake of our older children other children. Little did I know that the word forgiveness would haunt me for the next 30 years, prod me, guide me, heal me, label me, enlighten me, imprison me, free me, and in the end define me. I was right out there in public confessing to everyone the desire of my heart. When I joined Family Survivors of Homicide, the support group, I was quite forcibly told to forget about using the word forgiveness because they could only see the dangers of forgiving. In some ways, that was good for me because, as a Mennonite, it made me lose the religious lingo and forced me to be more authentic. Forgiveness is a hard word. It demands a lot of you and is so often misunderstood. At times, it was incredibly tough. People said we couldn't have loved Candace because we forgave. One woman said... My stance was dangerous because I was promoting a society where all the murderers would go free. Also, because the perpetrator hadn't been found, some people were suspicious of Cliff. But it's true that your enemy becomes your best and most wonderful teacher because people's reactions taught us who our friends really were. You can't play games around murder. There's a kind of vulnerability and transparency that occurs and you have to become a better person to get through. You can't stay around in the fog. You need to soar to go higher. That's forgiveness. Not knowing who the killer was all these years didn't stop us from moving forward, but we had to fight. 
against being obsessed. We knew that murder takes a life, but we also knew, through the appearance of the bereaved father at our door, that the aftermath of murder can be just as deadly. She then goes on to describe how in 2007, everything changes when someone is charged and imprisoned. And then she finishes off by saying, for me, forgiving has been about turning what has happened to us into good. Forgiveness is not just a one-off event, nor does it mean you're doing the same thing again and again. The issues of candidate's murder present themselves differently every day. Forgiveness is a fresh, ongoing, ever-present position of the mind, which takes on many different forms. It's a promise of what we want to do, a goal, a North Star, a mantra. Wilma's story is one of around 40 stories that I share in my book, and they're all very different from all over the world. <laughs> 